Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's really an honor to uh, spend some time with you today. And um, my hope is that uh, my intention for today is, well, well, I wish I could change the externals in our world. As many of you are probably waiting to hear announcements on various fronts around uh, jobs and finances and, and the nature of opening, reopening our, our, our world at this point. Um, today's conversation is really about helping you to, to give you some names. Uh, we, we, in our field, we call it name it to tame it. What can we do to, um, to reconsider how we're holding being and, and maybe uh, settle into a way that's a little more helpful um, and, and, help, and, and enduring and, and sustainable as we try to ride out this storm. So, um, so start with an introduction. Uh, Donovan Samara, Israel, class of 89. I work, the, my physical office is in the Kingscote building, which we moved there uh, last summer. And uh, it's a beautiful place, come visit. Uh, whether you're visiting the help center or other places, um, the Sarah office and CST and a bunch of other places. Uh, we're under, well being at Stanford, my unit is under the Baden umbrella. So um, reported uh, up, up the chain to Jim Jacobs, the head of the Baden Health Center. And um, I'm a health educator. So uh, I like to tell people I first learn and then teach the art and science of healing, health and happiness. So how do we, uh, because life is a full contact sport, and thank you to uh, the Rec and Wellness for sponsoring this, you know, life is a full contact sport, and we have to be able to uh, re repair and heal before we get back out on the soccer pitch of life. So what does healing look like uh, emotionally, spiritually, physically? And then health is the everyday maintenance of life of, of as Roxanne said, making yourself a nice breakfast, getting enough sleep. Uh, remember, these are ongoing. Uh, none of this is said and done. Uh, only, only breathe as long as you want to be alive. And so it's not good enough that I exercised five years ago or five days ago. I, I, it's, a, it's constant maintenance. And so we can just embrace that, that just like breathing, um, it's, we're never done. We we're, we're just continue to maintain that over time. And then, and then happiness, thankfully, around the time I graduated with a degree uh, in psychology from Stanford, the, the subfield of positive psychology was invented uh, by um, Martin Seligman and a bunch of other uh, gurus in psychology when they decided, why are we studying all the bad stuff and we're not studying any of the good stuff? And so fortunately, so many good, great researchers on, on our campus and other places are studying the good stuff and helping us how to live a life with gratitude and compassion for self and others and awe and elevation and a bunch of other terms that denote positive states of being, love even, there are love researchers and so forth. So, so I hope to uh, give you a combination of both today. I should also tell you that in addition to working with well-being at Stanford and Veda and um, I'm a lecturer with Health and Human Performance and I teach uh, Stanford students through the wellness ed program teaching a course on healthy romantic relationships right now uh, by the way these are some things we could provide to staff through help if there's any staff on the line uh, through the sorry sorry through the hip the hip program not the help center but um, I also teach a course on decision making and a course on positive psychology the science of happiness Lastly, I should let you know that I also work closely with an organization, a beautiful organization in Palo Alto called CARA, and we'll be talking about grief today uh, a little bit too, so, so I bring that up for a reason. While I change screens and we, we get uh, the share screen going where I'm going to share uh, um, uh, my screen in a second, uh, at the risk of unleashing a, to a torrent, a torrid, a tor what is the word, a torrential uh, wave of, of words. Um, if everybody could chat in right now, uh, the answer to the following question, uh, what's the hardest thing right now? What's the hardest thing right now? So just go ahead and chat it in. I'm going to try to look at it and get the gestalt of it and see what's coming in because I don't want to assume that at week nine, uh, yeah, so the uncertainty is still there, huh? 
Um, I don't want to assume that at week nine, it's the same as it was at week six or five. The hardest thing, wow, motivation and loneliness. And um, Roxanne, I'm going to go ahead and share now if you, is it, is, it, is it okay for me to share? Oh, yeah. Okay, so we're good. All right. The fear of the future, no travel. Okay. Missing in-person connections. Living in a studio, it's uncertainty but lies ahead, same routine, worry that the fall and spring. Okay, great. And, and, and please be looking at the chat to get some, I see some familiar names, by the way, shout out to Imelda, um, just to get some resonance that, you know, um, one of the things that was brought to light by Kristen Neff, um, Kristen Neff, And common humanity has to uh, consider that we're not alone. We're not alone in all of this. And your chat, the chat just box just went away. So I'm sorry, I'm not looking at those anymore. I'll try to figure out if I can do that. But get some resonance and some common humanity that sadly, when we get into states of mind like depressions and anxieties, they're very self focused. And we can start to convince ourselves that we're the only one that's experiencing this thing now and even in the past. Um, I've, I've been finding a lot of uh, sort of uh, paradoxical relief by reading uh, books about World War II and the Holocaust and so forth because it resonates with a sense of being isolated and the kinds of threats that are in the world. Now, obviously, those are, that's, a, that's a big comparison but you may find resonance from different narratives that help you to feel like not only are you not alone in this moment, but uh, many of your ancestors and people who weren't your ancestors experienced very, very difficult times. Um, the war took many years, for example, and we're dealing with many weeks at this point and heading into many months. But it might give you some courage. It might give you some uh, support in knowing that others have and are um, making the efforts that you're making to try and survive and thrive in these times. So I started creating this presentation uh, when the crisis hit and started to just put down, so let me back up. So I have this model, which I'll share briefly. It's a, just a very basic model, but the idea, as I said, with healing, health, and happiness that, uh, at the intersection of ancient wisdom and modern social science and neuroscience and, uh, and other kinds of science, we, I think we know a lot already about the human condition. And when students come to talk to me through our coaching program at Wellbeing at Stanford, I like to think of it as they're unraveling a ball of challenge, of suck maybe, of difficulty that they don't really understand, unraveling it, teasing it apart, and then applying a set of awarenesses, mindsets, understandings from science, again, and ancient wisdom to then clearly see the, the problem set in front of them so that they can move forward with it. Um, so that's what I hope to do today and just get, and share some of my, um, uh, my, my, my thoughts and my, uh, the way that I try to appeal to these needs in my own heart. And then my hope is that some of you will be able to ask questions about how to apply these things in the practical world. And, and, and we, I know we only have an hour, but um, we'll, do, we'll do the best we can. So uh, obviously on everybody's mind is the isolation, the inability to hug uh, the people you love and to be in their presence, um, to, to things that the internet can't fix are, are uh, touching somebody at a distance, not yet anyway, um, the smell, the vibrations that we think happen from heart to heart and um, body to body. So there's a lot that's missing. And so I just want to acknowledge that it is really a challenge to, uh, to connect in the first place, to maintain connection, and then to deepen that connection. These are all big challenges in relationships. Uh, just a few um, thoughts on that um, to, 
to really understand how deeply important it is for humans to be connected. Uh, I remember reading, I believe it was a National Geographic, a, um, a marine biologist said that a singular dolphin uh, separated from its, uh, it, it, its pod of dolphins is not actually a whole creature. It's not a, a true and real dolphin in and of itself. What a powerful statement that these creatures are so connected that their skin enclosed uh, individual person is incomplete. And so I want you to really think about that, that the root of loneliness as, we, as we'll see, the root of disconnection is not about necessarily even being in the presence of other people. You can be on a subway train and be very close to people and touching people even, but feel alone as we know. And so really what it is as we, as we go into the part about deepening, I think, I think by the way that the internet has a lot of resources and, and has been very creative around connecting and maintaining uh, at a distance from dance parties and, and happy hours and uh, games and, and, and conversations and we have chat and we have the phone. I wanna spend a little bit of time actually talking about the idea of deepening connection. In order to do that, let me go to my next slide where we see Dan Siegel's four S's of attachment. And I love this, very simple, it's alliterated, and it really describes the needs that all humans have from other humans, or you could say the rights and responsibilities of being a mammal around other mammals. I'm including your cats, dogs, and other furry creatures. Uh, it's not clear that fish and lizards need this, but uh, I, I wanna keep an open mind about that because we've seen some stuff to the contrary. But seen, safe, secure, and soothed. So I'll get the scene last because that's what uh, I want to talk about. But so starting from the bottom, um, soothing. This is crucial. Um, we need to be able to soothe ourselves and others. Um, this is for life in general. This is what emotional intelligence is. One of the roots of emotional intelligence, I know when to soothe my colleagues and myself in hard times. Uh, humans have. The, the, there's a there's a system in our brain of, of, of interconnected parts called the mammalian caregiving system. The mammalian caregiving system is is all about soothing. Um, my wife just showed me a um, live uh, video uh, of uh, some people who are um, who brought some uh, kittens into their home to do some fostering, and you can watch these kittens on the internet. Uh, um, mammals are all about soothing each other, whether it's playful soothing of kittens, whether it's the simplicity of a warm body. Uh, we know from the, uh, the caged monkey and the, and the fuzzy monkey study done by, I forget the author's name at the moment, um, that, that milk is important, but the, fuzzy, the fuzziness of a teddy bear, the fuzziness of our blankets, of our socks, um, the warmth of our feet. These are all uh, pathways into the, the mammalian caregiving system. Warm soup, warm food, and in other times, a warm hug. Um, just a caveat here that obviously humans have created many ways to soothe ourselves that can border on and full, fully become abused to be unhealthy. And I'm speaking of drugs and alcohol. I I don't think it's a problem if I share that I fully expect to have a beer after work today, but uh, we all know that uh, some of us may be suffering from uh, overusing certain manners of soothing to where they become um, unhealthy. And, and I, I don't want to add to any shame about that. This is, this is part of the human condition with the opiate uh, issue that we've had, but it's, it's something that's happened throughout time where we where we like the pleasurable, soothing feeling and we use it to the point where it no longer soothes us, but it actually creates more problems. So that's another issue on the table for my colleagues and I. Secure basically means that when you, you come back, when you say you're gonna come back if you're the mommy and that you do what you're gonna say and you say what you're gonna do and the people are around you are secure in your, uh, in your doing and in your being and in your care. Safety is, as you might imagine, physical and emotional safety that we're not being violated. And to start it all off is the word seen. So humans, mammals really must be seen. Uh, as a thought experiment, do not try this at home. Imagine if you ignored your dog for the day. 
or a month. God forbid you put them into isolation where you, they couldn't see you even or be touched. So that little thought experiment, humans long to be seen. We were visiting a, a home for the elderly here in Palo Alto with my kids a few years ago where we were singing songs and on Shabbat and delivering some challah and for the Jewish community. And uh, I ran into a woman who was a founding member of our synagogue, at least one of the older members. And she's, her, she and her husband were in a memory unit. And she said, I looked at her and I said, oh my goodness, it's so good to see you. And she looked back up to me as I held her hand and she said, it is so good to be seen. Humans long to be seen, to be literally seen. And this woman was now in a home for the elderly where her husband was dealing with memory issues. So, so who knows how much unseenness she was experiencing. So we long to be seen. And, and, and that literally means waved at while walking down the street. By the way, I was listening to a podcast from the TED Radio Hour on loneliness. You can check it out. And there was some conversation. Uh, we need those weak bonds. So for those of you who don't know what that is, that's, that's um, the barista at Starbucks who you kind of know their name or not, but you talk to them and they know your story or the, the, the old folks that walk down your street and you wave to them every day or the dogs, the other people with dogs that you kind of see at the dog park. These are the people we don't know well, but they're part of our community. One of the things we're missing here is those weak bonds. And one of the things that they suggested was to get a chair and sit along the sidewalk or on your porch if you happen to live along the sidewalk and simply wave to people and holler at them, uh, obviously in appropriate and non-demeaning ways. I see you. Um, how are you? Uh, your dog is cute. These kinds of weak bonds can be this, this feeling of being seen. Uh, even before COVID, I would ride my bike to work and I would say good morning to people who were walking their dogs or on their phones or walking and they were surprised that I would acknowledge them. But the older folks for sure appreciated that somebody saw them. And so again, this idea of being seen is so powerful. So going, so again, to repeat, for the weak bonds, get out in community, even with the mask on, and say hello to people. Tell them that you see them, have a conversation about how they're doing, and then move on. You will feel better. There's also a lot of research on people um, having conversations on public transit when we could do that. And the studies show that people who face their fears and talk safely and appropriately with people on public transit feel happier and feel better. So the weak bonds. For the deeper bonds, I want to give you a suggestion and I'd love to hear feedback if you try this. And this harkens back to what many of us called letter writing. You can raise your hands maybe for others to see. How many people had pen pals or wrote letters back in the day? What I'm suggesting here is long form continuous writing where you're able to share more deeply about yourself with a chosen trusted other. In today's world, you can literally write a letter using a piece of paper and a pen and, and assuming the postal service is still running, you can send that letter and then wait for a response. What I would add is to put a deep question at the top of the page in addition to updating the other person on your daily life which is more the surface to put a deep question which which prompts you to access deeper parts of you things you might not have touched yourself in a while you may be in touch into questions that you can't even answer yourself so that you'll have to you'll have to do some deep searching to answer it for yourself before you even write it to your partner Deep questions can be found all over the internet. Powerful questions, prompts, who are your heroes? What was the hardest time in your life? What inspires you most? Um, find a deep question and answer it for yourself and then share it with a trusted other. If you decide to use Google Docs, you have a lot of versatility with the utilities that are on there. You can put the question at the top of the page, answer it, 
wait till the next morning to re receive a beautiful uh, treatise from your partner on their responses. And then you can proceed to respond lovingly and compassionately or questioningly to the other person through the comment section, the comment function to say, I've never heard that about you. You've never told me about that before. Tell me more about your trip to Europe and how that changed your life and your career. So, so what I'm encouraging here to get back to the topic of seeing is that being seen is not just about the external being seen. It's about, does somebody really get me? Does somebody really feel me? Um, Dan Siegel actually uses one of these terms, I can't remember which one, but he talks about feeling felt or getting got, right? Who are the people in the world that ever got you? There's probably not many of them that really got you. Uh, philosophically, maybe we could argue that nobody will ever fully get us, and that's part of the human experience. But, but those moments where somebody really gets me is so powerful. So, and I think we can do that on chat. I don't think we can do that on uh, Twitter. I think we can only do that when we describe in long form, in depth, when we study ourselves with deep study, and then we write that research paper, that me search paper to another person, and then they lovingly respond to that. You will feel less lonely when other people can see your insights. And I think the media that we use most, social media, as we, as we talk about, really shows better the outsides of us or the surface of us. Any questions on that uh, to my co-hosts? Uh, any questions coming in uh, specifically around uh, connection and uh, feeling connected, attachment? Yes. Um, hmm. Yeah, from Jan. So she said, this tactic of answering a deep question, writing and sharing is fabulous. Where did this idea come from? Is there a book we can read that talks about this technique, one of Dan Siegel's books? You know, it's a good question. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, it's, not, it's not something that comes to mind as, as being in a book, although one could argue that any any author who's ever written about memoir or about personal narrative or any author or who's doing live retreats around personal discovery and writing, um, you know, knows this, uh, you know, maybe a therapist knows this, but uh, this came to me because back when my wife and I, my partner started to date was back in the nineties when it, the internet and email was first invented. That's, that's why, by the way, I have the Donovan at Stanford email address, my first name only. Um, and what I found was that uh, my, my, my uh, then partner or girlfriend at the time had gone to Hawaii to do a graduate program. We started writing letters. And I found that it was really powerful to share seven paragraphs about myself in depth, un uninterrupted. By the way, if I didn't say that already, part of it is the uninterrupted nature of your sharing. And then you press send on that email, and then the next morning you get this juicy response. Uh, not only the sense that you've been heard and seen at a distance of 5,000 miles across the Pacific Ocean, but that then that person would now share based on your share. And that reciprocal loving obligation. And by the way, if I didn't already say this, this is how, this is the answer to the question, how do I deepen how do I deepen and strengthen relationships? It's by vulnerable, you know, Brene, so Brene Brown would be the author that would have you talk about vulnerability. So that's, that's easy. That's Brene Brown, who brought that to us in 2008 in her work on vulnerability and shame. But basically, if you have two people talking about the weather and sports, well, they're not talking about sports right now, but one person shares something deeper about their sick mother and the other person shares, the other person shares, the other person shares. Now you have a deeper conversation. This also comes out of the idea of summer camps. Many of you went to summer camps where you were prompted to share at a deeper level uh, with a partner who you just met that Friday. 
uh, on some really deep topic and by weekend's end or week's end or the end of the month, you felt like you knew your camp friends much better, or sorry, your, you felt like your camp friends knew you much better than any of your family and friends back home who'd known you your whole life. So these are some of comes from the idea that deep knowing of a person isn't about time. It's about the level of vulnerability and the deep vulnerable sharing that we're able to do safely, hopefully, with another person. And to have them respond by saying, oh my God, I didn't know that about you. That's so powerful. That, that really touches me and inspires me. I see you. So experiment with it. If others have books they want to send out about that, please do. But this is the ancient art of basically correspondence and letter writing. Love letters, if you will. I'm gonna move on a little bit and get into this. And I, I, do, I do really honor each of your questions and would love to answer them. So let's find a way to do that going forward. You can also email me at Donovan at Stanford. Um, but about grief, as I said, I work with Cara in Palo Alto. I have my own grief story. We're doing a grief gathering for uh, students tomorrow, uh, Thursday at four o'clock. And we're also doing something on non-death related grief for students on Friday at, I believe, 11 or 11.30 uh, called Dancing with Disappointment. If you're a staff member and would like to help do some of these things or in cooperation with us in religious life, we would love to support you. There's a lot of grief right now, a lot of loss, not to mention the stuff that happened way before COVID. The main point here, uh, by the way, I should mention, I have a daughter who graduated the other day and is trying to figure out how to feel graduated during the COVID crisis, graduated from high school. The main point of this section is to really try your best to give space to all losses. All losses deserve, yes, within, with, you know, maybe titrated or balanced against other more serious losses, but all losses deserve our attention. Because again, as we say in, in this field, you have to feel it to heal it. You have to name it to tame it. And if we ignore and suppress even the smallest of grief, we have not named it and we have not felt it. And thus we can't tame it. And thus we can't heal it. And so I give the funny example of losing $5. It's kind of funny because the other day I was picking up trash in the neighborhood, which by the way is how I feel hopeful about our world. I, I walk around in, in the beautiful day and I also pick up trash to try to make our neighborhood just a little bit nicer. And I literally found a $10 bill and a $5 bill on the ground, which is kind of funny because my example for smaller griefs is, if you were to lose $5 walking around and you didn't plan to lose $5 because who plans to lose $5? You get to have $5 worth of grief. Now, in an ideal world, that $5 would be exactly proportional to $10 and $20 and a lost iPhone and a crashed car and, and then on the, all the way up to death and dying. And now, if only psychology was that simple. Um, for example, if you grew up poor and you lose $5, it could trigger you into a sense of shame because, because when you were little, losing $5 was a really big deal. And so now you're dealing with loss and shame. The point of the story is that all emotions are there to teach us something. And if we start to get into the comparison and the, uh, what do we call it? Um, comparison shopping of, of loss, then we never get to learn the lesson of whatever it was we were supposed to learn by losing that $5. And so let me be more clear clear. There are plenty of losses right now from graduations to just not having to have Starbucks with your good friend and give them a hug like you do every Friday before COVID. What I'm suggesting is that, yes, we do hold it alongside the deaths we're seeing in our community of 90,000 Americans and not to mention the whole world and not to mention the suffering of our traumatized first responders and the marginalized people in our country who are, are, are in the pathway of this fire that's burning. 
But what I'm suggesting is that we hold it alongside of our $5 loss saying, I want to acknowledge all of it. And in theory, the smaller the loss, the smaller the loss, if we give it our attention and a little bit of space to hold it, it should dissipate sooner. $5 of loss should dissipate sooner than $5,000 lost in the inter on the stock market, theoretically, right? This is all kind of tangibilizing and theoretic being theoretical. But if we, don't, if we don't allow ourselves to grieve that loss, it's gonna stick with us and go into the grief volcano. So how can we acknowledge the loss of our seniors for graduation with full acknowledgement and feeling and awareness when that, when, when that arises? And then when, when we, we read the newspaper later about somebody who died, we can also give that attention, but not get into this push and pull between, you know, shut up Donovan, why are you talking about the fact that you can't go play hockey right now when people are dying? That's not gonna serve us because that's only going to get you to repress and suppress the losses of the daily events and suppressed grief goes into the volcano and it takes a tremendous amount of energy to hold it in the volcano. We use skills like drugs and alcohol to kind of put the cap on our grief volcano, as well as in my opinion, depressions and anxieties do not come from too much sadness, loss, worry, and the like, but from unprocessed sadness and loss and worry. So we need to process our emotions like processing data to make sense of it in order for it not to hurt us. And for, in order for it to become wisdom that we can use in making decisions going forward. For the graduate students out there and for the, the academics out there, the metaphor for emotional intelligence I use is processing your emotional data. You cannot turn in a hard drive or a stack of papers of data to your professor and expect to get a PhD. You have to process that data, make sense of it, do a lit search, a method section, lots of graphs, make up some new terms, use some old terms, have a conclusion, draw some conclusions about future research, and then you can turn it in. You have to make sense of the data in order for the emotional data not to hurt us. And I'll end this section by saying, back to Dan Siegel. Dan Siegel makes bold statements like, for those of you who don't have kids yet, your children will do better in life not based on whether you had a hard life or an easy life, but to the extent that you have processed your emotional data and made sense of it. I'll say that again. Your future unborn children will do better in life to the extent that you have made sense of your past, your emotional data, whether that was an easy, relatively easy past or a powerful and very uh, traumatic past. So grieving all the losses is really important. I wanna take some questions there uh, because I know that that's really a big sticking point for folks. Champagne problems, Donovan stop complaining about you stubbed your toe when people are dying, that kind of stuff. We do this all the time. There's a, there's a positive way to do this by the way, but it's the positive way is not to shame yourself by saying, if you say first world problems, that's fine if you do it with compassion. If you say first world problems, but you do it by shaming yourself and suppressing your emotion, that is a problem. Let me take some questions there. And I'll show you the slide on gratitude coming next while we, while we see if there's, Roxanne, are there any questions about that? Because um, not, not as of now, but okay. I'll keep an eye on it. Oh, so let that sink in. Um, the parenting quote, does that require formal counseling to process from Aaron? The parenting quote, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, not sure what the reference was there. Unborn children. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, great question. So, th so this is from Dan Siegel, and, and, he and, I, and I, I, I can't give you the book right now because he has so many books, I can't remember which one it is. But he's just a great resource. Um, you know, 
I would say all, all manner of processing, so formal and informal, um, therapies of all kinds. And by the way, if you can't find a therapy you like, you're not looking hard enough because you are in the devil's triangle of modern new age therapies. I like to joke between uh, Marin and Santa Cruz and Berkeley. Like if you can't find it in this neighborhood, you're not looking at all. Uh, let's be clear about that. Um, so processing data, it's a beautiful question, by the way. You can dance your data. You can run your data. I mean, uh, going for a jog, by the way, um, exercise is a great way to process data, but I do still think people should add qualitative processing like talking and writing. You can sculpt, you can paint. Um, but yeah, I do think we need to put words to it because we're, we, we're, we're a culture that really uses language a lot. So um, in your heart language, that means the language you grew up speaking, uh, finding names for things, finding analyses for things, and when I say analyses, I don't just mean rational intellectual analyses. I mean emotional analyses. I mean spiritual analyses. So finding ways to hold what's happened to you in a way that makes sense. By the way, making sense does not mean you approve of it. It does not mean you like it. It does not mean you would do it over again the same way. It means that it happened and you have to be able to tell a story where you put a period at the end of that story. I love, you know, even Forrest Gump, right? Forrest Gump teaches us, right? The great, the great philosopher Forrest Gump teaches us, you know, shit happens. Can I say that on this? Um, crap happens of our life and say chaos happens, crap happens. And then as Thich Nhat Hanh says, as we make sense of it, we, 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 we turn that crap into fertilizer and then we grow the lotus, we grow flowers, we grow plants from the fecundity, the, the richness of our, our past as we make sense of it. So yes, all kinds of therapies, use them all, whatever works for you, that makes you feel better and you feel like you've, you've gotten it out of you and you, get, you have a better sense of what that thing is. The key is you do not want it, the data set to be stuck in your body. If it's stuck in your body, Get a massage therapist to massage you deeply. There are stories of massage therapy touching a certain nerve and the person just starts crying. The, the hard drive is literally our body. Uh, the, oh, there is a book, by the way, the body, what is it called? Somebody takes us out about uh, the body is our storage device for emotion and everything else. So uh, the body something uh, stores our stuff, whatever it is. So somebody texts that out. If it, it's, it's a book on my list for sure. Uh, our body tells a story, something like that. The body keeps score. There it is. The body keeps score. Our body is a storage device. If we don't process out that data physically, spiritually, and emotionally, it will do damage like a volcano does damage. Beautiful. I have another question. So the good news about loss. Yeah, yeah, please. Oh, please. Sorry, no, you can continue. I apologize. Um, I just had a... I got a question in um, from an anonymous attendee um, that I thought was yeah. really, after processing emotions, how do you let them go if a similar event happens again? Yeah, so remember that your beautiful central nervous system, well, let's say, let's talk about your limbic system. This is the mouse brain slash plus, plus the uh, lizard brain. Say thank you to your mouse lizard brain because basically without those parts of you, you wouldn't be here. Your parents, your ancestors would long been gobbled up by a saber-toothed tiger or a space alien or something. So um, remember that every time you experience a negative event, your amygdala is going to, if it's working properly and you're not in such trauma that you go into a disassociation, your amygdala is going to want to take note of that. I always joke about if you ever got bit by a purple chicken, uh, anything related to purple chickens are going to freak you out for a bit. And so you want your amygdala to keep learning from new experiences, even if those new experiences are old experiences. So let's say that you process with your therapist your fear of snakes for 20 years and then you literally get bit by a snake after you just all you were 20 percent you know you only had five percent fear of snakes and then you get bit now a real thing happened you actually got bit and there was some threat you know 
So, you know, it's an ongoing process of, of healing. Uh, life is a contact sport. Um, if, if you were in a classroom right now, I'd ask you how many of you have chronic uh, sports injuries. I know that my, my beloved right leg has had more surgeries than many people have had, you know, on their whole bodies. And so, so we have to make healing a normal part of life, like breathing. Knowing that life is a full contact sport and old injuries as well as new injuries will arise all the time. So it would be too much to ask you to let go of an injury that just happened because it might be an old injury or a new injury. But our job is to constantly be aware of, and what I mean there is we need to listen to our inner self as it tells me, Donovan, by the way, we never got over that breakup in seventh grade. Remember Jenny? or Johnny, can we talk to our therapist about them? We need to listen because there are wounds within us that have never been healed and we need to give attention. We need to attend like a nurse. We need to attend our beloved nurses, right? Attend to that wound. So uh, trying to let go of things too soon, not a good idea. Um, you can't heal a knee uh, just because you want to. We have to allow it time to heal. So I think I'm, I hope I'm answering your question, but we need to give attention to the, the wound until it heals, until we're ready to let it go. And then if it flares up again, well, there we are. Just like my knee, I fully expect to have another surgery in about 10 years for my knee. God willing, I have 10 years. We'll see what they have in store 10 years from now. Great question. Uh, let's move along here. Gratitude is born in loss. So the good news is that all of us right now, just as in Palo Alto, the housing prices are probably still going up as homes appreciate. Uh, when, you, when you experience a loss, even a temporary loss, like I can't sit in Starbucks with my good friend, I can't browse Target you know, just for fun for three hours anymore. When we experience losses, um, gratitude is triggered naturally. That is, um, the feelings of loss fully engage us and help us see clearly how much we value that thing. The key here, by the way, and the Buddhists know this, and I just learned that all world religions know this, is that you can have your cake and eat it too with gratitude if you start a gratitude practice, which means that you start to rehearse and remember, appreciate all the things you have today before you lose them. Again, to have your cake and eat it too. So that is to say, when you, when you have a gratitude uh, practice and you think of three things you're grateful for today, you are rehearsing the valuing, the appreciation, the increasing of value of the things you have today while you have them. So here are two practices that you can try. One is long form and one is short form. Back to the long form letter writing. If you seriously full on wanna make your English teacher from high school cry, if they're still with us, or your professor from Stanford or wherever, or your second grade teacher, write them a gratitude letter from your heart. You will full on make them sob tears all over your letter. And not only will you make them feel good and fill their heart because teachers teach because they love to teach. And when they know that they have taught you, they, their heart will be touched. So writing a gratitude letter is a beautiful activity for COVID. If you, you can deliver it in person over Zoom, that'd be great. But in any case, send it. If a person has died, you can still write a gratitude letter and you still benefit. And depending on what you believe, maybe they benefit. And then for those of you who don't have enough time because you're still busy during COVID, you can write a gratitude text. In fact, I'll be one of the few teachers to invite you to use technology while I'm talking. You can write a gratitude text right now to somebody on this call uh, through the chat, or you can write a gratitude text through your phone to somebody who's not on this call. It doesn't have to be long as long as it's heartfelt translating feelings of gratitude to other people. So when COVID is over, we will surely have a lot more gratitude for the simple things of life.
I think uh, we have another question. Is, is there an easy way to grieve your losses? Does writing it down help? Beautiful. So uh, James Pennebaker writes a lot in his t more than 20 year career about the value of journaling and writing as a therapeutic method for all kinds of things, including trauma. So, uh, so ch ch check out James Pennebaker's work. And yes, so writing about everything is helpful. Writing about grief for sure. So you can write about, if it's a person who died, you can write about what you loved about them. Um, uh, complicated grief is a little more complicated. We can get into that if you're, if you're mad at that person. But um, you can write about what you missed about that person and you can also write about how you're coping in the moment and how it feels uh, to miss them. Um, so a couple of shout outs for grief. Um, CARA in Palo Alto is a beautiful grief organization still providing services online. Um, the Help Center does a lot of grief work, Roland Shu and Rosanne and a bunch of other people and groups that they hold. Uh, I think they do grief, grief groups a little bit. I'm not sure if they're doing them now. Um, for Stanford students, come see me or other uh, coaches at the Wellbeing at Stanford at coaching.stanford.edu. But let me just give you a pointer though on choosing a provider. Just because somebody's a good therapist doesn't mean they're grief trained. Let me be clear about that. If, if a person has not done their own grief work and really worked some time in that, I would rather have you be seeing a lay volunteer at CARA who has done the grief work than the best therapist in the world who has not done the grief work. So, um, so that, yeah, and there's a lot of good grief books out there, by the way, tons and tons of amazing grief books out there. So Google can help you with that. But, um, but yes, please, um, please find somebody to walk with all of the hardest data, emotional data in our life. It's really good to have a mentor, a therapist or a coach to prop you up and support you and love on you as, the, as you walk into the darkest places in your life. So please don't go into the darkness alone. Please take someone with you. Uh, that's especially true of trauma, by the way, but I would argue with grief too. So I'm conscious of the time. I'm gonna to try to get to as many slides as I can. I just knowing that I, I'm not able to get to all of it today. Um, I may just scan through them at the end and, and show you what I've got. And then maybe I can, we can set something else up. So uh, this, is a, this is a slide really looking at the helplessness that we all feel. Um, I gave you some language here, surrender, acceptance, humility, uncertainty. So a reminder that surrender is not giving up, as we say. It, it may be literally, but not, but not all told. Surrender is really um, a combination of acceptance and the serenity prayer, I think. The idea that, I, that Donovan becomes humble and decides that I'm not going to push back against what is what I can't and what I can't control. I don't, well, I don't think I've ever said it that well before. Let me say that again. So, so being humble enough to, to stop pushing for a second at least on what is that I can't change and, and uh, that which I can't control. And, and again, acceptance, not approval. This is, does not mean you have to like it. In fact, if we're talking about surrender, probably chances are you don't like it. So we don't have to approve of it, but we can say, um, I dropped an egg on the floor. I can, I can argue with the egg for an hour. And by the way, this is where grief comes in. We can, grieve, we can grieve that the egg is on the floor, but to fight with the egg and say, egg, I wish you weren't on the floor. I wish you were back in your shell. So how do we start to stop burning energy, pushing against what, uh, what is and trying to control what we can't control? So humility is a big part of that. It's been called the greatest virtue. And, all of us are humbled right now by this tiny little virus. This little creature that's not even really alive has humbled this great civilization, so-called. So we're humbled. So, so, so finding a way towards those things. Pema Chodron is a great author that writes a lot, a Buddhist author that writes a lot about acceptance um, and uncertainty and surrender. 
So a few words on uncertainty. We're being asked to face uncertainty. I want to talk a little about, about building up your tolerance for uncertainty and embracing it. And I love that uh, what Rec Reckon Wellness is bringing this today because one of the, the metaphors I bring to this is athletes. Athletes train themselves to embrace uncertainty. Serena Williams would rather be nowhere else than center court at Wimbledon facing 120, 30 mile an hour uh, uh, serve. A baseball player would rather, rather be nowhere than at a stadium right now at home plate facing a 100 mile, 120 mile an hour fastball or whatever, 110 mile an hour fastball. This is uncertainty, okay? And people like it, they train for it. Uh, and they and they and they they would rather be knowing, doing nothing else than facing the the uncertain ball. The ball is always uncertain. A surfer, a surfer trains to surf the waves. A surfer does not try to control the ocean. The surfer controls their body for sure, but wants the ocean to be crazy. It wants the gnarly. He he or she wants the gnarly, tasty waves. They want but they want to trust their skills to surf and navigate the treacherous ocean. And, and lastly, improv, improvisation for those in the, the, the taps field. Improvisation is a beautiful mindset where folks like Dan Klein and my other colleagues uh, who, who, who do this beautiful art of improv would like nothing rather than to be on the stage with their, with their well-practiced compatriots doing a, uh, a scene in reverse in Latin uh, for a half hour about a pickle. Uh, this, is, this is the first. So I, want, I really want to stretch us to know that those of, you, th those of us control freaks out there, it's not the only way to be in the world. We can, we can like control, but we can also like uncertainty. And that can be something we not only face, but tolerate and embrace. I'm going to power through because I, I see the time coming. I gave you some great quotes here on acceptance, a great um, This is a time to be resourceful. Crisis is the mother of creativity. I hope all of you are being really proud of yourself for the resourcefulness that you have out there as you take the mud, as you take the, the fecund dark matter that life has given you and you grow flowers. Some of you literally are gardening right now. So please be, be excited about the MacGyver, your inner MacGyver that's coming out in these times. And, and, and a lot of you are doing that and it's beautiful because resilience is about responding to stressors without breaking by flexing and stressing, stretching, sorry. Patience is another piece. We're being all called to be patient. I have nothing more to say on that, by the way, because I'm challenged by that. I have nothing more to say, but we need to practice patience. Enoughness is something Stanford needs to practice in general. Stanford is a place where excellence rules. Uh, the E for excellence also is the E for never enoughness. It's easy to be a Stanford person where we feel we're never enough because everybody to my right and left are excellent and I am not excellent enough um, standing next to my colleagues. So, so this list here with including self-compassion is about a sense of enoughness. And by the way, I talk in depth on this on my TEDx, which I did for Pali High School. If you uh, Google Donovan Yisrael TEDx Pali High School, you'll find a TED that I did. Um, so you can take a look at that. I want to end by talking about despair and meaning. Please, 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 if you are struggling with a sense of uselessness, helplessness, and hopelessness, please listen to your inner uh, your inner sensors that are speaking to you, your feedback mechanisms, if you're feeling a deep sense of uselessness, helplessness, and hopelessness, because that could be despair. And despair is very dangerous. Um, so please get help if you're in despair. Um, Jews go as far as to say as despair is forbidden because it's such a dangerous area. It does happen. Uh, there's no shame in it, but we need to hear the call and get help. And so I encourage all of you to um, find the smallest thing in your life that, that helps you to feel useful, helpful, and hopeful. And again, the 
smallest thing that helps you be useful, helpful, and hopeful, whether it's reorganizing your spice drawer in alphabetical order, as my kids just did recently, or, or folding all your t-shirts again, whatever gives you that human false sense of control. There's a lot of evidence that humans need a false sense of control to be, to be neurotypical. So start with the, the useless stuff that actually makes you feel hopeful and helpful, and then move on to more helpful things that help our world. It's something I call hope hygiene, a concept that I created. Whatever fills your bucket of hope, please find a way to fill, to make yourself feel more hopeful. And a lot of that is about mattering. Find a way to matter. My wife delivered some food to the elderly this week. Uh, she does it every three times a week. Find a way to matter in our world. So many people need you, whether it's donating money or donating food or delivering food, picking up trash. Find a way to matter in our world. Be a variable in our world that changes the outcomes. So I'll leave you with this. We are meaning makers. I've already said this. Life is a full contact sport. Life serves up not only lemons, but mud, but dirt, fecal matter. Life serves that up. The interesting news, not news to gardeners, is that's the best stuff to grow your flowers in. So as Thich Nhat Hanh says, the lotus grows in the mud. We are meaning makers. Stanford was created after two bereaved parents wanted to do something so that maybe their child's death would not be in vain, to make meaning out of the death of their 15-year-old child. And we all benefit at Stanford University from this meaning. So I encourage you and I empower you to make meaning out of this mud. What mud, what thing will you brag about after COVID and say, hey, I started this thing because COVID inspired me out of necessity and out of suffering to create this thing. Begin that process now of growing the flowers out of mud. Let's stop the share, and I know we don't have any time left, but what I would love to get some feedback because uh, my inner critic attacked me all the night because I didn't get any feedback from you all and tell me that I did a terrible job. I, I wish I was lying about that, by the way. We can talk about self-compassion, the inner critic, and shame at another point. If you'd like, let those uh, who put on these pre presentations know if anything you saw today is interesting to you. But what I would love is to capture anything you learned from today's session on the chat. So if you could just chat in one word or phrase or sentence of one thing that you got out of today, um, Roxanne will help me to capture the chat into my, uh, to, to save it. And um, that will help my inner critic, help me to quiet down my inner critic tonight. So any little small thing would be great. So please do that. And again, thank you to the sponsors from uh, Rec and Wellness. And uh, just again, to let you know that there are people standing by at the Help Center, at CAPS, at Wellbeing, uh, the Religious Life Office, the GLOW Office, Res Ed. Um, there's people all over campus, the HIP Office, Continuing Studies, all kinds of gurus on campus. Please find a way to um, process your emotional data. Thank you, everybody.